Carbs, carbs, carbs. We all love them. Whether it's pizza, whether it's pasta, a big old burger, or my personal favorite, a hot jam donut straight out of the fryer at the Sunday farmer's market, they're fantastic. They taste great. They feel good in the moment. But like most things that feel good in the moment, they come with long-term costs. And when it comes to eating those carbs for lunch, when it comes to our work, it can often leave us feeling a little bit like this come the afternoon. But why is this the case? Why does eating carbs lead us to crash in the afternoon? Well, it has to do with high GI or high glycemic index carbs versus low GI or low glycemic index carbs. Now, why is this the case? Well, high GI carbs will essentially spike our blood sugar levels for about an hour or so, and then they'll come down fast, leaving us to crash and feel absolutely lethargic and deflated and ultimately flat come the afternoon. But what if there was a way to have your cake and eat it too, so to speak? What if there was a way to eat your carbs for lunch without crashing in the afternoon? In this episode, I'm going to unpack four ways you can do exactly that, some of which I've spoken about in my recent book, Time Rich. But first, if you like this show, take a moment to like, share, or subscribe, and leave a comment below, what's your favorite carby food? Okay, now let's get into what the science says about eating carbs for lunch without crashing in the afternoon. Method number one, physical activity after eating. Now, numerous studies have shown that when you eat and then walk, move, exercise after eating, it will drop your blood sugar levels, essentially numbing the glycemic index of the carbs you just consumed. So how long should you actually move for to reap these benefits? Well, a 2018 study published in Nutrients found that the blood sugar levels of participants dropped after just eight minutes of moderate cycling. Furthermore, a study published in JAMDA found that when you walk for about 20 minutes after a meal, that's enough to decrease blood sugar levels. Meanwhile, a 2016 meta-analysis that looked at 39 studies actually found that light aerobic activity after eating at about 60% of your VO2 max is the best way to decrease blood sugar levels after eating. And if you're not sure what your VO2 max is, I'll have a link to a calculator for you in the show notes. Now, in that particular study, they suggested working out at that level for about 60 minutes. But if you work out at a higher intensity, you can bring that down to just 30 minutes. So how soon after eating should you walk? I mean, should you just down that carby lunch and get straight out the door and start running? Now, if you grew up in a household like mine, your thinking would probably be no. If you grew up in a household like mine, you were told that you need to sit down and just let things digest for 30 minutes before you move. You've got to let things digest before you jump in the water and go for a swim, that sort of thing. And in fact, there was more to this than just conventional wisdom. Science actually backs this claim. So the nutrient study I mentioned earlier actually found that the optimal time to start moving after a meal is about 45 minutes after you've commenced that meal. So if it takes you about 15 minutes to eat, you're looking at about 45 minutes minus 15, 30 minutes after you finished your meal, that's the optimal time to get moving. Number two. lemons. A recent study published in the European Journal of Nutrition actually found that dousing lemon juice on carbohydrate foods like bread actually lowered the glycemic index of those foods. The researchers tested different types of products such as tea, lemon juice, and water and found that only lemon juice decreased the blood sugar levels. In fact, lemon juice decreased the GI index of carbs by about 30%. Now, why was this the case? Well, it turns out that lemon juice increases the acidity of the food while decreasing the pH levels. Now, this actually serves to slow down the rate at which your body digests the starch found in products such as bread, pasta, rice, potatoes, and so on. So before you sit down to that big old bowl of pasta, maybe just douse it in a little bit of lemon juice. Method number three, enjoy slow carbs instead. Instead of opting for the white bread or the 
gold, potatoes. You could go for something like rye bread, darker forms of bread, or sweet potatoes, both of which have a lower GI index than their traditional white counterparts. For example, the GI index of, say, the white bread bun you might find in a traditional American hamburger is about 75. Multigrain bread, on the other hand, has a GI index of just 48. Now that's about 40% less than its white bread comrade. Sourdough has a GI index of just 54. Again, quite a bit less than white bread. Now this essentially extends to other forms of carbohydrates, whether it's brown pasta, brown rice, uh, like I said, sweet potatoes. There are numerous alternatives to your staple favorites that not only help you lose weight and focus more in the afternoon and avoid that dreaded crash, but actually in many cases taste better, although that's subjective, than the typical traditional white starchy counterparts we're used to growing up perhaps. Your burger and your fries have never looked and been this good for you. And method number four, eat less. Instead of four slices of pizza, perhaps have three. Um, or do something that I like to do when I buy a burger. Occasionally, I'll turn it into a convertible. I'll just take the top off, and I've taken pretty much 50% of the carbs out of that burger. If I'm at home, I might just scoop out some of the bread. Might sound a bit crazy, but at least I get that burger vibe sans a few of the carbohydrates. Um, nowadays, a lot more retailers, burger joints, pizza joints are offering low GI alternatives, whether it's a whole meal uh, or multigrain bun, whether it's whole meal dough used to cook their pizza. Uh, there are always, not always options, but there are often alternatives, especially if you live in a big city with lots of eating choices. Now, far too often society and all of its narratives likes to break things down into extremes, binaries, do this, don't do that. But if we heed the Buddha's word and take the middle path, we often find that we can actually enjoy a hell of a lot of food without suffering the cost to our waistline and to our focus, especially when it comes to our work. And of course, an alternative to this is to simply not eat at all. And I've got a link up the top to an episode I did on fasting. With that, I'm gonna bring this episode of Workflow to a close. I'm off to enjoy a low GI burger. <laughs>